Folks, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm Danny. We've got with us tonight uh, two of my favorite people, uh, and a lot of your favorite people as well. I've got uh, Zenova Hooper from uh, Macomico, and also Manson Meekins. And uh, we'll talk about uh, some just what it was like growing up on Habits Island. In Manson's case, uh, he knows a whole lot about duck hunting and stuff. He knows a whole lot about fishing. Uh, it's always good to talk to him about uh, you know, the way things were before we had any roads down here. And Miss Zenova, of course, uh, <clears throat> is just such a great way to get a perspective of uh, being up in Chickamacomico, uh, North Rodanthe. When you think about some of the changes that have gone through uh, on the islands here, uh, the changes in, uh, up in Rodanthe have just been uh, spectac spectacular. I mean, most of y'all have seen changes as well, and it's just been phenomenal what this island's going through. Some good, some bad, but uh, you gotta take the good with the bad. Uh, what we're doing is, uh, this is the Land of Beginnings Festival. Uh, we have about two weeks here in April that we do every year. It's just, quite simply, a way for the local people to be able to experience a little bit about what it's like to live here. It's really, uh, you know, if we have any vacation or all, we to come sit in, but it's just a way for us to enjoy the quality of life uh, that, that we've come to enjoy here. Okay, uh, Manson, I'll start with you. Uh, I know that your uh, father and your grandfather were all in the Coast Guard in the Life Saving Service. Uh, your father mm -hmm. was, uh, was uh, George Harrison. George Harrison, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the uh, keeper there, uh, actually the officer in charge at Cape Hatteras Station. Cape Hatteras Station and Cape Hatteras Group. Mm -hmm. Two stations, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you went, uh, when you joined the Coast Guard, uh, I guess you knew all along that uh, you want, that was a way for you to get off the island, kind of see the world. Well, almost all along. <laughs> uh, it depended on uh, how much schooling I could get uh, by the time I finished high school and maybe go to college. Uh, I finished my last year of high school in Elizabeth City. I boarded with uh, friends in Elizabeth City, out Riverside, mm -hmm. nice place, sailboats and stuff. And uh, they were uh, relatives or kind of acquaintances from Avon originally. But anyway, I went to Elizabeth City uh, because that was an accredited high school. And in order to go to college in those days, you needed to finished at accredited high school, so that's why I went to Elizabeth City. And so I went there, uh, can I expound on Elizabeth Absolutely. City? Absolutely, please do. <laughs> well, yeah, I went there in, uh, in uh, August, and I, uh, my transportation was from a, uh, by way of a uh, freight boat that ran from Avon to Elizabeth City each week, uh, bringing uh, uh, groceries, provisions, uh, lumber, and anything you know, back and forth from Elizabeth City. So it was operated by Mr. Lauren uh, O'Neill. <clears throat> so I took the boat to uh, Elizabeth City and transportation from downtown out to where I was going to uh, take my steamer trunk, close a little distance, and <clears throat> so <clears throat> this very, the, the river was full of moth-type sailboats in the, in the end of the, about August. <clears throat> so this uh, beautiful young lady uh, sailed up to the side of the freight boat, and I was standing there, and I started talking with her, and, and uh, I said, I have to carry my uh, luggage out to Riverside. She said, I live out Riverside, sort of. And, uh, Loaded a board and I'll take it out there. <laughs> so I loaded that big, uh, my <laughs> steamer <laughs> trunk, big old, full yeah, of yeah, almost a, a steamer trunk on that uh, uh, moth type sailboat, and off we went. <laughs> and she took me to the, the place where I was to live, and uh, that was the first uh, interesting thing that I encountered in Elizabeth City. And then we had a real bad storm, a hurricane, 1933. And uh, 
Uh, my father, uh, at that time, was also in charge at uh, Little Kennedy Station. And uh, he was going to send me some money to buy the books with, my books. So uh, the storm came, all transportation was disturbed. The uh, CA Kohler sail ship came aground up by north of Little Kennedy near Salvo, up that area. And my father was, uh, a part uh, was a participant in the rescuing the people from the ship. And, uh, uh, I knew I knew I wasn't going to get any money right away because everything was shut down. Right. So during that storm, when the wind shifted from the northeast to the northwest, it blew almost all the water out of Passaic River, Elizabeth City. <coughs> you could go down. <coughs> excuse me. You go down, and walk along the shore, and uh, you see all kinds of things that had. Uh, became evident that it had been there for years on the bottom of the river. So Bill Miller, uh, my, my friend, who I was living, living with, and I went down and we found this big pile of uh, what we later found out was ri uh, uh, ring dogs. It was a, uh, a wedge type uh, piece of iron, something about this size, where they uh, sharp on the bottom of the, that a ring on the top they call them ring dogs and they found out they were used at that time uh, by the mills who gathered timber up and down the river and they they would drive these wedges into the, the piece of timber with a chain and tie the big floats of timber together and float them to the mill and left the city mm -hmm. so this fellow who was in some sort of a business uh, Found out we had them, and he gave us six cents a piece for them. <laughs> Shipwrecking. <laughs> yeah. Came in real handy. Six cents a piece. So uh, we had a couple, 300. So I, I used that money to pay for my books. Well, in a week or so, uh, uh, after things uh, began to open up a little bit, uh, it was a little slower than now to get the roads open and to think. Well, I, uh, I went to school, bought my books, and uh, I graduated from Elizabeth City High School in 1934. <clears throat> and you asked me a while ago about my uh, uh, plans to go in the Coast Guard. Well, it wasn't final, but uh, most of the people that uh, were able to make a living were in the Coast Guard, Corps of Engineers, Army, and so forth. And uh, so my dad, Talked to me about it after I graduated from high school. I said, uh, uh, he said, well, you can, uh, I'll try to send you to college. I wanted to do some engineering studies. Or you can go in the Coast Guard. So uh, I thought it over and I said, well, <coughs> let me stay home a year before I go to work. Uh, we'll think it over, and by that time, well, we'll know what to do. Uh -huh. He and Daddy, mother said, that's fine. So uh, I stayed around Avon a year, and it was a very enjoyable time of my life. I bet. Hunting and fishing and uh, doing things in general. Well, do, uh, do you, uh, what can you tell us about the old Avon school there? Uh, do you remember Mr. Stanley Green? The old Avon School was before Stanley Green, yes. Okay. But the old Avon School was right next to my uh, parents' home where I grew up, and uh, that was that school was destroyed uh, in a winter storm. It blew down and was wrecked about 19. It must have been around 1929 or something like that. Okay. 30. But the school was wrecked. And about that time, uh, my father was transferred from, uh, at that time, is it uh, uh, the station at uh, Assens Creek. There's a new station been built there in 1938. Dad was Assens Creek, so he got transferred to Portsmouth Island. At that time, I think it was, it was a warrant officer. So he, he, brought, he took the family 
during a uh, summer, the old school had been destroyed. We moved to Beaufort, North Carolina, and he was stationed over at Fort Macon. And I went to school in Beaufort up until Christmas that year. And then he was transferred back to uh, uh, this area. Uh, so we moved back. And I, I finished that year, half a year at Hattress down here in 19, uh, early 33. Well, all the, uh, all the villages had their own schools. Uh, the school that we've had now serving, that, that didn't happen when you and Zenova were growing up. Every village uh, had its own had school. school. Yeah. Well, they built a new school at Avon, which is on the right, was on the right now as you go into Avon from the stoplight. About uh, where the fire department is? Uh, yeah, it was far, just a little farther north, and uh, uh, my wife Vera went to school there, and a lot of other kids, and uh, I think that was the last school they, building they had in Avon uh, until it was consolidated. Mm -hmm. Well, Zenova, uh, where was your school? Was it in North Rodanthe, or was it? North Rodanthe. Mm -hmm. I went there in the first year. Then the second year, I went southward at that school. Right. I rode the school bus then. Yeah, the school bus. <laughs> yeah. Rode at the, I had to walk twice a day. Uh, who were some, do you remember any of your school teachers? Were these local ladies or? Uh, the main one was Miss Lois McNabb. Mm-hmm. She was from over on the mainland somewhere or? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm I don't know exactly where. Right. Well, uh. Do you remember some of the, uh, I guess you had like spelling and, and some of the same subjects they do today? Is there, can you? I think we had more important than they do today. Right, <laughs> well. We had spelling, writing, and arithmetic, and English, and history, and geography, and all of that. Today they have different subjects, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, when you were going to school there, I guess. Uh, you and your sisters and your brothers, you were all pretty close in age, weren't you? Yes, we were. From Frederick right on through your... That the last one. Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, did your, uh, your mother and father, I guess, uh, they didn't have a whole lot of opportunities to go to school there, so they were glad to uh, make sure that you and those girls could go to school. Well, my mother went away. She went to school. Miss Rance was her teacher, and my granddaddy wanted her to be a school teacher. And he didn't want her to get married when she did, so she got married and she wasn't a school teacher except teaching her own children. Right. Well, uh, what can you tell me about uh, growing up with your sisters? Uh, I know the Olives here and, uh, and Lovey. Uh, uh, what, what did y'all do for fun? I, you, uh, I knew you had uh, some horses that you, uh, some of you girls, <laughs> Was there a lot of livestock up there? A lot of cows and yeah, there was all kind of livestock. Mm -hmm. Cattle, sheep, goats, and horses, and geese, all of that stuff. I guess they just the the horses kind of roamed wild and ate what little forage was around. Well, on my the daddy beach. had some pinned up to the Coast Guard station, and that's the ones we used to ride. We used to ride them on the beach. And we used to sometimes hitch them up to a car and go pick up wood off the beach. See, back then you had coal stoves and wood stoves. So you had to have wood to have a farm. So we used to use them to get wood as far as with. Right. Uh, <clears throat> you told me one time a uh, story there. Uh, sometimes these horses and uh, you know uh, could get away from you. And uh, I remember one st uh, story you telling me about the horse kind of took off and ran for a couple, three miles, quite a few miles before you could finally get it to stop. Yeah, that was Elizabeth and I. We went on the marsh one afternoon. We left our school books down in the schoolyard. and went on the marsh and got our horses. We took them up to the Coast Guard station. We saddled them, put the bridle and everything on them, and we had a horseback ride. Well, my horse, he wouldn't let another horse go by him. And Elizabeth knew that. Here she'd come. I said, Elizabeth, slow down. And she kept coming, and my horse took off in a run. And I got Miss Ella's fence, 
and I almost went over the fence. But I held on to me, and I stayed on him. Good gracious. <laughs> we used to have so much fun horseback riding. Oh, I'll bet. Uh, you know, I think kids today with the cars and stuff and having a TV, uh, you know, kids are indoors a lot and stuff, and they, they didn't have the opportunity. They have the opportunities to go outside like y'all did if they, if they would just take advantage of it. I've got a book here that uh, Miss Sanova has put together. It is really fascinating. Uh, it's going to be coming out here pretty soon. It's called Growing Up on Hatteras Island, and it's her recollections of, uh, with her sisters and her family and stuff. One of the neat things in here that we, we don't hear so much about is really a lost art was uh, some of the midwives. Uh, Zenova was delivered by a midwife. Uh, uh, her brothers and sisters were as well. And some of these midwives, they were as sharp as any doctor at that time. As a matter of fact, I would think that the mothers were a lot more uh, comfortable having a midwife in there uh, than one of the doctors. Uh, your, your aunt was, was a midwife. My grandmother. Your grandmother, okay. What was her name? Uh, Mary Williams. Okay. Did, uh, and she delivered most all of your... She delivered them up until the, the twins. No. Yeah, the twins. I told the twins. Then Aunt Randy did that. Right. And Randy was a midwife too. Aunt Randy midget. How how many? Uh, you know, I, I guess between those two ladies, there must have been a hundred, maybe more, children that they delivered over the years. Would oh, you I think? I can imagine. Yeah. Where was the school located there that you went to early on? Same place it is now. Oh, okay. Where the community building is. Right. Same place. Well, did you grow? Did you have? Uh, did you have quite a long walk, or were you close by there? No, I was the last house in Rodanthe. I had to walk it twice a day. Didn't matter whether it was raining or mosquitoes too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some things never change. That's one constant: is these mosquitoes. <laughs> well, tell us, uh, tell us if you would, uh, some stories there about. Uh, I guess growing up with your sisters, did y'all have, uh, did you, you know, you have uh, playhouses or anything? I guess you gathered berries and stuff and, you know, uh, tried to play house or play kitchen there with, with some stuff. Did you have a little playhouse with your yeah, father? Yeah, we had playhouses, but my cousins down in South Rodanthe, they had a regular house for a playhouse that their daddy had built them. So we used to go down there and play with them a lot, and we'd go ahead and excuse me, and gather berries and make out like we were cooking. It was a lot of fun. The, uh, Manson mentioned the wreck of the Kohler, and uh, I guess you were probably in your teens, and do you remember? Do you remember the Kohler? I remember when it comes ashore. Mm-hmm. I guess that was... 33, like wow. he said. Okay. Uh, uh, did, did that hurricane cause a lot of damage up in Rodanthe? As you can recall, was there a lot of flooding? The one before that caused a lot of damage in 32. Okay. And the one in 33, he wasn't so bad. Right. Up there, he was worse at Avon because they had a dike. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The 32 did a lot of damage in Rodanthe. We were taken out of that <laughs> stairs window in a boat. Wow. So they just loaded you and your sisters and your brothers up and... One All at a time? Mama and Papa and, uh, let's, let's see, eight of we children. And we had company that had to come in to spend the, to stay there during the storm. And one lady with two children and then a young boy. And the young boy, he was there when the tide began coming up, and he didn't get to go home. So he wanted this uh, lady that had come. Her baby was born in February. This storm was in March. And uh, he wanted her to let him try to get the baby over to his aunts. And uh, she wouldn't do it. She said, you're not taking my baby out. So, so he asked uh, my mother. He said, well, how about taking Arvel? That was her baby's name, it was Arvel. 
and he was born in August, that this was in March. And she says, well, go ask Fred. That was my daddy. So he went and asked him, and Papa came up the stairs. And Papa says, well, you lock tell him. You better let him try. Said, bundle him up good and let him try to take him over to his aunt's house. Said, because if he stays here in the morning, says he's not going to make it. Says, because we're going to have a bad time this tonight. Said, I know the weather's going to change. It's going to get real cold and he'll freeze. Said, so let him try. So he did. And when he went out of our house, I don't know how he got through the house, because our house had gone for blocks. Wow. And all you could see was him holding the baby up like this. You couldn't see his head. You could just see the baby up, wrapped up in that blanket. And he got him over there. And he came back with a boat, and that's how we got out of the house, was in that boat. And it was blowing the whole time? And blowing the whole time. Just rain, yeah. driving rain? Mm -hmm. Wow. And the um, next morning when we woke up, everything was covered in snow. Good gracious. And all the clothes that was downstairs were up on the, there was a ridge like in Rodante. They went the full length of Rodante. And that's where the clothes stopped on that ridge. Oh my gosh. Well, Manson, uh, do, do you remember any storms uh, that stand out in your mind? Uh, I, I know when the when the 44 storm came along, you were probably off the island at that point, weren't you? Yeah, I was away in 1944, up in New Jersey. The, uh, <coughs> we had several storms, <coughs> of course, when I was growing up. But uh, the, uh, the one that, uh, that uh, happened while I was living is the uh, 44 storm, which of course I was uh, stationed away from Avon, but I do remember the storms we had when I was a kid. Uh, I remember laying down on the floor during a storm, and you, and the, the tide from a sound would come into the village <coughs> and flood the village, and you, I, I remember hearing the water sloshing up under the house under on the floor where I was laying you heard the water sloshing up on the house and uh, <clears throat> of course the, the the 44 storm or the, the storm that I, that uh, really did a lot of damage was because uh, a lot of people from Avon moved away from Avon some of my friends relatives but uh, so after the, after I went away, why well, most of the storms happened while I was away. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it had to, Zanova, when uh, you're talking about that storm there where they had to take all of y'all out of the upstairs window, it was probably, you know, exciting in a way for kids, but I know your parents <coughs> had to be mortified, and your mother, I know she yes, must have she been. Was. Yeah. Wow, that, when, you, when you think about the magnitude of uh, that kind of flooding and stuff and the damage, I mean, you know, uh, we can, we get kind of used to it. Uh, you know, living out here, that's just, it's not convenient living here. But, uh, you know, some of these storms back then uh, was uh, just life-changing. I mean, Manson said, uh, you know, that, that a, a lot of them did move away. And as a matter of fact, uh, Buxton is, is full of people who moved in from Avon because it was a little higher there, and, and Chick McComico as well. Well, speaking, speaking of storms, the people who are down here now just can't imagine what this beach was like before the sand fences and dunes were built. I said from Buxton to Oregon Inlet, there wasn't a hill anywhere except about where uh, number 12 highway is today. From there over, there was vegetation, grass, and trees. But there over, it was mostly all sand and uh, blowing sand and and people uh, had to drive on the, uh, like, if you had to go away in an automobile, you wait till low tide most of the time to go down below the surf. So you could get to Oregon Island and catch the ferry uh, within an hour or so. Otherwise, it would take about three hours to get from Avon to Oregon Island, driving on the, on the beach. So there was just no, uh, there was no hard surface. And the only hill that I can remember 
from Buxton to Oregonella. It was north of Little Kenny Keat, uh, just a little ways away from the uh, uh, where the dune is now, a hill about maybe uh, uh, 25 or 30 yards in diameter with grass growing on it. That's the only hill on the beach. So you walk over from the beach to where 12, 12 is now, and then the grass started. And then the grass would go up pretty high and you get over farther towards the sound, the vegetation like myrtle bushes and yopon bushes. And then where there was ridges, we call them ridges, where the sand had blown on the formation of these islands had gotten high and those were grown up with uh, uh, oak, oak trees like you see today. But other than that, the vegetation was, was real uh, scarce. And the, like I say, the beach was uh, uh, infected by wild hogs, sheep, cattle, and horses. And they uh, would find their uh, sustenance over near the sound in these swamps and lowlands. That's what they ate, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so it's just amazing the change we see over here now. You, you walk over and see the dunes on the beach and uh, of course, in those days, you could walk over on the surf without being interrupted by anybody. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Well, do you remember some of the CCC uh, efforts that they were doing out here when they were putting these dunes together? <clears throat> well, I, I went into the Coast Guard in 1935, and it was just about that time or just after they established the CC camp down here at Buxton. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my friends went into the CC camp about the time I went into the Coast Guard. and. Uh, and when I would come home on vacations after that, why I would visit the CC camps, which is right down close to where the lighthouse is now. And in addition to the CC camp between uh, Buxton and Frisco, there were what we call the uh, transient camps. There's adults, older fellows. God knows where they came from, but they were going to give them something to eat and something to do. We call it the transient camps. And uh, that that's a little known uh, uh, establishment. That was another group of people. And, but the, the CC boys, as you know, uh, were the first to plant vegetation on the beach and make sand fences and put old trees down to start the sand blowing on the beach where the dunes are today. Mm -hmm. And later came the sand fences and the dredging and so forth to build up the beach. So it's altogether different. It's unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. Uh. Do, do you, has it, I know it saved the highway, and st or not saved the highway, it actually has given us a highway and, and allows us to come and go, but uh, I guess at the same time, you know, there's a lot of people who say that it's really altered the way uh, that Mother Nature does her engineering and stuff, uh, so I, I guess, uh, is there anything that sticks out in your mind about, uh, do, do you feel like, like, like these dunes have helped, helped us here? Uh, well, <clears throat> of course, over uh, where the, the villages are, particularly in, in Buxton, where you had, it began with large dunes, sand dunes, like like we have up to uh, uh, Jockas Ridge. These were minor than that, but that's where it started anyway. And then vegetation. But uh, most of the uh, villages, as we know today, were on the higher ridges that grew up in oaks and stuff. And then the spotted between, say, between Avon and uh, Canadian Hole, over in the lowlands, there were higher ridges that uh, people settled on, had houses. And uh, you could go by there when, when I was a kid after they had moved and see the uh, open places and among the bushes and uh, shards of, of uh, China from their dishes and stuff would be where they once lived. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, like I say, the cattle and horses uh, and the sheep and the pigs were what sustained us a great deal. And the, there's a long story about that, which I'm familiar with. Right. Well, did your, uh, did your folks have a garden? Uh, you know, did uh, y'all have big gardens that uh, y'all used to, you know, keep self-fed? Yes. Uh, 
my father, at the time I was growing up, mostly was at Little Kinnikee. And over on the edge of the wetlands, you might say, <clears throat> where the moisture stayed in the summertime, each man at the station had a rather large garden. <clears throat> and I know <clears throat> throughout the island where there, was, where there was moisture, that's where they put their gardens mostly, and they raised mostly uh, collard greens, which today I, I, I hated them when I was a kid, but my mother used to have them quite often. But today I like them. And, uh, <laughs> and the, uh, so they would, uh, that was the extent of the garden. Most everybody had a garden. They'd plant potatoes and things like that, sweet potatoes. Right. And then they would rely on the, uh, the livestock for uh, once in a while somebody would, what we call it, killing a beef. <laughs> Someone word would get to the village that Mr. So and so is going to kill a beef today. <laughs> So uh, the kids would be uh, uh, very anxious to find out what was going to happen. And uh, so I remember one thing in particular about uh, killing beasts. I never forgot it, and I never heard of anything like it since. It's quite interesting. The, the cows and the, were, out and the, were out on the uh, grasslands grazing, and right about where uh, the stoplight in Avon is today, from there on in towards the village was grassy. So this day this fellow went out there with his horse and cart and he killed this, what we call beef. And they would kill the beef and uh, skin it and cut it up in chunks and put it in tubs and put it on the back of the cart and go down to the village. That would later come. But the kids got out there and some of the boys says, uh, hey, let's have a cow beller. You know how cows, they bellow, it's not beller, but we call it beller. Right. <laughs> let's have a cow beller. Okay. So we went over and got the head of this animal, which had been discarded, and drug it over near an old cow that was over grazing, right close, upwind. And she got a whiff of that blood. And she walked over to that head and started, we call it bellering just as hard as she could. That was a cow beller. And then the other animals in the area, must have been maybe 15 or 20, they put their heads up and they would come running to this cow that was doing the bellowing. And they would sniff around and they would start bellowing. <laughs> and the kids were really, uh, you know, uh, uh, entertained. And then all of a sudden, the cows would stop bellowing, and they would go off and do their business of grazing. I have never heard of that incident since. Not even seeing the cowboy stories out in the West. But it's something between the cows and the blood which created some remorseful scene. I don't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was... That was one another source of uh, beat. The other was fishing and hunting, mm -hmm. and that's that's uh, when I was growing up. I was very. You want me to say something about? Yeah, hunting? absolutely. As a matter of yeah. <laughs> I was about uh, maybe in the eighth grade in school, and some one of the boys says, uh, "Say, Manson, so and so's got a gun down there in the swamp." He says he shot it. <laughs> He says, uh, I bet you won't shoot it. So three of us went over there and found this gun. He had taken his father's 12-gauge shotgun and brought it over with a couple of shells. He scrounged from somewhere. He said, if you want to shoot it, you shoot it. I never shot a gun before. I was just a little guy. So I remember picking up that gun, and he showed me how to put the shell in it. And I put it up, and if you hear a shotgun uh, go up, if you're nearby, it sounds real loud. But if you're right behind it, I found out you don't notice it much. So I put the thing up, turned it sideways, and closed my eyes and pulled the trigger. And it was absolutely amazing. No loud noise to frighten you or anything. And that was my beginning of uh, handling guns. And then I started a little uh, time after that uh, in search of something to eat, particularly wildfowl. Uh, 
I went with a boy up to the north end of Avon called Big Island. And uh, well, he had a gun. And uh, we hadn't killed anything. He said, why don't you take this gun and go up ashore uh, up north of Avon. Up, there's a creek thing called Spencer's Creek. He said, go up that way and see if you can find a duck in the creek. <laughs> so I went up there with that, along that shore looking. And in those days, the sea tide, this we call a sea tide from the ocean, would run across this sandy beach periodically and cut gullets along the shore. And I was walking along and I saw this duck sitting in this little pond about maybe 15 or 20 feet where, this, where the water had cut it. And one end of it, half of it was covered with float grass. I thought to myself, well, how am I going to get down to that duck and close enough to shoot it. So the duck must have seen me or something and it dove. And I ran full blast down with my gun. And it was, and, and, and then I saw something come up under that grass, a lump of grass. <laughs> I was up like that, I went boom, and the old duck went there. And I went there and picked it up and I shot it all to pieces. But that was my first duck. That was my first duck. <laughs> but, <laughs> But then uh, later, we hunted along the shore, and uh, as I got older, uh, Mr. Calvin Meekins, who was that time the guide at the uh, hunting club, Phipps's club, uh, just uh, south of Avon, mm -hmm. he was in charge of the decoys and the uh, and the boats and everything. So I was in just as kid in school. He says, Manson, we're going out hunting tomorrow. Why don't you go with us? I said, okay. He says, we're going to use a, a, a battery box. Now, in hunting, there's a battery box, there's a sit-down battery, uh, and a uh, curtain box or sink box, and a blind like you see sticking out on the reef today. Mm -hmm. So this time, it was legal in those days to use what they call a lay-down battery. And the lay-down battery was about the size of a good-sized coffin. And the guy laid down in it with his gun along the side, and they had projections out on the side, flotation, that kept the battery up just above the water. <laughs> But the hunter could lay down in there and get below the surface of the water. And the thing would only stick up that high. And uh, so he said, you get in the battery first. So I went in there and I laid down that thing. I'll never forget it. I laid down the thing and like, my head like to kill me. You didn't have anything to lay your head on. So anyway, I was suffering. And this duck said, Whew! right over top of my head and lit right down to the foot of the battery and the decoys and I had my gun laying there and uh, I said now if I shoot him I'm going to blow him out of the water like I did before you know ruin him you won't be able to eat him so I thought about him he was looking at me he was <laughs> a little what it was it was I know now it was a hen uh, scot we call them blackheads a right. hen oh, scot yeah. now a little duck diving duck he looked at me and I looked at him <laughs> And I raised the gun over there, and I said, "Boom!" I blew his head off. <laughs> and that, that was that was that was the laydown battery. And then later on, uh, Mr. Calvin, they used a, what they call a float a float rig. Uh, migratory birds and ducks, they go where the grass is. They go where the food is. They may be here today and over there tomorrow. But you know what they're using, they're getting some food. So the hunters, in those days, they were, they were meat hunters and also taking out parties for pay. They would find out where this raft of ducks were using and they'd take their blind in their boat, load it on their boat and go over and put it overboard like where the ducks were using, early in the morning about daylight. And uh, this time he used a, what we call a, a sit-up battery. It was a it was a, a, a tub about that square. You look down in it, it had a seat like this to sit on, put your feet on the bottom, and you put 
iron ducts around the side to press it down so it wouldn't float way high. And then you have these deckens run out so the water would float up under it and keep it, uh, you put decoys on it. And uh, that's, that, that was the float rig, it was a very, it was very effective. They later outlawed, the government later outlawed uh, battery shooting or any, any shooting device that the hunter, <coughs> inter, any floating device, floating, where you could move from one side to the other, where the hunter could hide himself below the surface of the water. The government outlawed, outlawed that, and it was a very good, effective preservation for a while. Oh, yeah. Well, those things were probably so effective. Uh, it, it, I mean, you could just go out there and rack up. Yep. With, with and the next, the next uh, type of a hunting device he put me in was what we call a curtain box. Out on the shoals, out about two or three miles from the village of Avon, there's a reef makes up out there. You leave the shore where the harbor is down Avon and go out there and you go into a channel which is eight or nine foot deep. Then you come up on a place we call the drum shoal. Then you go down on another slough about seven or eight feet deep. And then you come up on this big shallow reef we call it. It runs from Rodanthe through, through uh, Gull Island, right on past Avon, turns and goes to the southwest, clear on down to Hatteras. And it's only that deep sometimes, depending on how the tide is, and the grass grows in profusion. And those ducks go underneath that grass. Well, they have these have a uh, curtain box or a sink box where you take a concrete or a creosote box, maybe a four and a half by four and a half, and sink it down permanently below the surface of the water and hold it down with sandbags. And inside of that sink box, was rigged a, a plastic or canvas curtain. You could you could raise it up above the surface of the water, about that high, and get down into that box. <laughs> and uh, with your head just, you, and you would lower the curtain down so the ducks couldn't see it, where it was all just about that high above the water, and sit there and watch all around for the ducks to come in. <laughs> ducks and geese and the decoys maybe 56 or 70 or 100 decoys right around you. These birds would come in and light. And Mr. Talvin said, Manson, we'll go in the sink box today. <laughs> this, was, this was about the only time he ever asked me to go in, a, in, the, in one of the blinds. But anyway, he said, now we have some live geese that we use for decoys. That was a long time ago. And those geese were in, were in cages in boxes, about four or five in a box. The cages had handles on them. Two men could pick them up and put them aboard the bigger boat, take them out there. And they would stick a rod down into the, into the shoals and tie the goose to it <coughs> so he couldn't leave. <laughs> he said, Manson, if one of those tame geese get loose, you shoot him. Because they get loose and swim away. So he went off somewhere in his boat with another guy, uh, and I was sitting there doping, looking off to the southeast about some ducks down, and I turned around and looked, and there was one of those tame geese. He was out of gunshot, swimming away. I said, my God, Calvin's going to kill me, because I haven't shot that goose. That goose went out there a couple hundred yards. I kept watch on him. He turned around. I guess he got lonesome and swam back to his friends. <laughs> And when he got in gunshot, I let him have it. <laughs> Mr. Calvin came up and, and he, he said, uh, what's this? I said, oh, that's a goose you told me to kill him. And the fellow had a Joe Williams fellow, comedian was with him. He says, God, Manson says you killed Calvin's tame goose. The fellow told me to anyway. <laughs> so this, the interesting part, those tame geese, they call them nub them. One, on one end of the wing, wing, they would cut off a section mm -hmm. where the goose couldn't fly. He would get so off balance, he couldn't fly. But his part of his wing was cut off. <clears throat> so uh, we killed several fowl that day, and of course they would sell them to the people in the village. So he gave me this, uh, <laughs> this crippled goose that I had killed myself. <laughs> Probably... <laughs> 
and I sold him to an old gentleman in Avon. <laughs> I don't know what I got for him, 25 cents or something like that. And, uh, <laughs> and the next evening, out at, the, uh, out at the country store, in the evening, the young people and old men would gather around these country stores and tell tales, every kind of tale. And this old fellow says, you know, <laughs> said, I've been, I've been eating geese all my life, but yesterday I bought a goose from Mr. Calvin's up there. He said, one end of that goose, his wing was gone. <laughs> and he, he didn't realize what had happened. They, Calvin had cut it off. You know, that's what they'd always that did. He said, well, half of that goose's wing was cut off, and it had grown up. <laughs> That healed up, you know. So anyway, he uh, he said he was real fat, though. He said, of course, he'd been feeding him with corn, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was about the end of my experience as a youngster. From then on, I hunted everywhere. I hunt today. I have a couple blinds up there at age 95. I still hunt. Wow. And uh, <laughs> my wife here says, take somebody with you. <laughs> 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 well, uh, I guess, you know, people were real excited this year because every time you went off the island, you could look over there at Pea Island and they were most ducks we've seen in, in quite a few years, yeah. it seemed to me. Yeah. But I, I'll bet uh, out there on the reef, you really, you, you, when hundreds of them or even, even thousands of them take off at a time, it's probably, yeah. it's hard to convey what a yeah. beautiful sight that yeah. must be. Well, wildfowl was a delicacy. It was a real delicacy. And the first ducks that would come every fall were called mercansers. We call them fish ducks. It's a diving duck. These fish, just as fish as you could say. <laughs> but that was the first ducks that would come, and the boys would shoot them on these points, and, and they'd, <laughs> they'd have stewed fish duck. You know, I couldn't go out, but they did. But anyway, the next thing we depend on for, for livelihood, can I go any farther? Sure, yep. It was fish, fishing. And, uh, as I grew up, I fished a lot. We would scrounge old tore up nests, set nests. We boys would, would and wait them out and set them to catch. There's a lot of fish, there was a lot of spots and hogfish and croakers. You could set a net and catch them anywhere. But then as I grew a little higher, <laughs> older, there was a, this was about 1920, 27, something like that. I was born in 1960. <laughs> this was by 1927. There was an old gentleman in the, in the community. He, he and his wife, it was Mr. Leff Meekins, another Meekins. He says, Manson, he says, well, could, could you borrow your father's truck and, uh, and I'll use my net and we'll haul these sloughs on the beach to maybe catch some puppy drum and trout. Well, my father had, had a 1925 Model T. How many people know what a Model T is? Raise your hand. A Model T was one of the first vehicles that Ford put out in mass, mass production. That had a Model T, two-seater. Uh, later on, a couple years later, I guess the top went to pieces. And he cut the back seat out and built a, build a wooden little enclosure back like a truck, it. pickup truck. So I said, okay, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Leff, uh, maybe Dad will let me have it. He had another car by that time. He said, well, I'll furnish, I'll furnish the nets, if you, and I'll give you one-third of what we make. So we did. So he had, a, he had a, what we call a little haul net, which is about 200 yards long, that uh, we go down with that truck on the beach at low tide and to find these sloughs. You know what a slough is, a gully on the beach? That's where the fish congregate, and these sloughs, there's narrow sloughs, maybe 15, 20 yards wide that run along the beach outside, or, or bars that form up. You can wade the sloughs, get up on the bar, and it's only that deep. But anyway, he said, I'll wade the sloughs, and you just hold one end of the net. So we find a slough, but he said, one thing about it, when I'm going across one of these sloughs, you know, there's a lot of holes with these gullies that the tide cuts, like this or deep, some of them. He said, if you ever see me go under, boy, you start pulling on that nest. <laughs> I said, I will. <laughs> so 
this one particular day, we had caught some fish before, this one particular day, he gave me half of the net on my hand, I was holding it in my hand, he took the other half and started wading, had waders on, he started wading across that slough, water was up to about here, and I started doping off, thinking about something else, I was looking up and down the beach, and, I was up, and Mr. Laugh had disappeared, he disappeared, and I started pulling that net to pull him out before he was a hole in, about that time I saw him come up on the bar, he come up blowing, boy, and he crawled up on that bar, and he, and he took the end of that net that he still had a hold of it, and went on up soaking wet. It was in the fall too, and we managed to finish that set. <laughs> he come back. He says, he said, Manson, what's the matter? You didn't start pulling when I fell in that hole. He said, Well, I told him I said, Mr. Webb. Well, they said, by the time you got. By the time I started pulling, you were already out of the hole. <laughs> but that, that's how dangerous it was. We caught a lot of uh, speckled trout and puppy drum. The fish would congregate right on the end of the slough. And by the time we'd go across down with the outlet where the uh, current would go outside, by the time we got halfway up that reef, the bar, the fish would s suspicion something, they spook. And you see them hit the net, and the water would fly, spe speckled trout and puppy drum. I don't think I ever sold for more than a dollar and a half at the time. <laughs> but uh, the old guy, he go to the fish, they go to the fish house at the end of the week and get his check. He said, "Now, Matt Masson, this evening come up to my house, and I'll pay you off." <laughs> so. <laughs> He'd get his check, go to the store and get it cash, and have everything in nickels, dimes, and pennies. Quarter. He said, he said, here's a quarter for you and a quarter for me. <laughs> actually, actually, the poor guy couldn't count, really. He said, here's a dime for you, and here's two dimes for me. He said, I got a third, you know. Or here's a, here's a penny, and here's a big two pennies. <laughs> You'd go broke trying to make money, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we ever paid for the gas. I burned that old car in those days. 25 cents a gallon it was. <laughs> well, Miss Inova, uh, we were talking a little bit about gardens and stuff. And uh, did your did your mother, did she do any canning or anything? Did you all have figs? Or is there, uh, you know, what did, did, did your mom spend a lot of time in a garden? No, my daddy had a garden. Right. Mama didn't have time to work in a garden. <laughs> Too many children, right? <laughs> She didn't do much canning. I don't remember Mama doing too much canning. Right. Of course, we had so many to eat it. If we got it, it was eat, I'm sure. Three meals a day back then. Well, uh, you know, when, when you were growing up, uh, uh, did, did you all find yourselves, uh, was there always plenty to eat, though? Yes, we always had food to eat. I don't know how, but we did. He only got $60 a month in the Coast Guard. Mm-hmm. Well, there wasn't a whole lot of, to spend your money on. Uh, uh, food. Right. Well, Mama made our clothes mostly. But I'll tell you one thing. If she was making a dress for me, for one of we girls to wear on Sunday, if she didn't have that dress finished by 10 to 12, that sewing machine was closed. You didn't wear that dress that Sunday. You wore it next Sunday. Do you, uh, when y'all went to church there, uh, uh, what what is it? Was it right there where Fairhaven is today? Is that where the church no. has always been? No, it used to be on the west side. Okay. On the sand side. Mm -hmm. It was there until '44. Okay. On the sand side. '44 storm caused a lot of damage. Yeah, it did. That's when Gold Shoal Station went down. Okay, so flood took Gold, St Gold Shoal out. Okay, I think a lot of times you hear that it burned down, but yeah. no, it was a flood. Uh, can you tell us some about, uh, did you have any any heroes or aunts or uncles that you thought a lot of? Uh, I, one time I, uh, you told me about an uncle that used to pick all you girls up, just various kids, and would take them to, take them to church in his wagon and pass out some candy. And That was Uncle Joe. Mm-hmm. He lived at, kind of in the middle of the neighborhood. And on Sunday morning, he'd always stop every child's house, 
say, come on, children, we're going to church. And every child in that neighborhood would follow him to church. And we had to walk to church. And he'd come by our house, and all of we children would be ready to go with him. We'd all go to church with him. And then um, Captain Johnny was a great hero. Mm -hmm. He was the captain of the Coast Guard station. And he was everybody's friend. If everybody needed anything, they knew where to go. They'd go to Captain Johnny. And he was also, what you call a doctor, and the dentist. He'd take care of people when they got sick and when they had to have a tooth pulled. They'd go. I always said I'd never let him pull one of my teeth. But I'll tell you what, one time he did pull one. I woke up in the middle of the night with a toothache and I couldn't take it. I said, get up, Burgess. We got to go up to Captain Johnny. Well, you said you never had to let him pull your tooth. I said, well, he's got to pull this one. He's jumping. <laughs> and you know what he did? He just had a knife, a sharp knife, and he cut around the gum and pulled that tooth, and it didn't hurt. I guess the tooth was hurting, so I didn't feel it. <laughs> wow. But he was a good friend. And then Aunt Molly. Aunt Molly was the cause of me joining the church. One time we had a revival. And she was just shouting up and down the aisle. And I was on the end of the bench. And we were all standing up singing, you know. And she came to me and she said, Sanova, don't you think it's time you're joining the church? I said, yes, Aunt Molly, I think so. So up I went. Well, did she, did she play piano? Was she... Uh, no. She, oh, no, she, she was just shouting. Right. <laughs> People used to shout at church. <laughs> well, well, did you did you ever sing? Did they ever have uh, like at Christmas time or on Sundays? Did they ever have the children get up and sing? We always had Christmas. I went program was church, like Mother's Day and uh, Easter, Christmas. We always had programs at church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What church do you go to today? Uh, Clark's Bethel. Clark's Bethel. Uh, when you were growing up, uh, what was was there a lot of people living in that area? Uh, Salvo is just there's not that many people there. Was there more people living there when you were growing up, or about the same size? Or no, I think I think maybe there was more people then. I don't know how many is living there now, but there's not many people living in Salvo when I moved down there. Right. What can you tell me about? Uh, Right out in front of your house, uh, you and Burgess had the motel for a long time, but there's a uh, shipwreck out there. Is uh, the Richmond? Is it? Can you still see it? Is it still there? Or? Yeah, you still see it's on the picture mm -hmm. there. Okay. Yeah, that's it. The old Richmond. Right. It was there before the Civil War. My husband's grandfather said it was there when he went to Salvador, and he said he came ashore in a barrel. I don't know if he did or not. But that's what he said, he gave me a shoe in the barrel. And he said he was there then. And he was 90-some when he died. So he was there, and he said it was before the Civil War, he was there. Mm -hmm. And it's still there. Do you remember anything about World War II? Uh, you know, I, I guess there was a lot of ships going by here. W were you living? Were you living here? Were you yeah, I remember we had to have green shades to our windows. You weren't allowed to go on the beach. And the Coast Guard patrolled the beach. And I think they were very cautious how they patrolled, too. And you were, you didn't have much sugar at that time. And there was a lot of things during the war then. Yeah, a lot of things were rationed. Uh, some of the yeah. things, even though you're kind of isolated up there. A lot of things that you kind of took for granted, uh, they weren't available anymore. I guess gas was hard to get gas yeah, to go anywhere. Was. Mm -hmm. When you were uh, when you were a uh, child, uh, did your uh, parents or did you get a chance to go to Manio or even e any further? Did you get a chance to get off the island much? Uh, I guess it was a big deal. Well, I went off with uh, I had a cousin and her father, Uncle Arthur. He uh, rode the mailboat, and she was 
little over about eight years old when she lived in Mandio. And I used to go and visit her, and I'd always go on the mailboat, because he drove the mailboat, and he'd take care of me going up there. I'd stay probably a week and come back home. How long did it take uh, to, to ride to just a couple, three hours? Was it? Well, it was just a little old mailboat. It probably took half a day. <laughs> All right. <laughs> they weren't known for their speed, were they? No. I remember the first time he told about the Trenton. I remember the first time I went to the city. That's the way I went. Those four of us went to Mandio on the mailboat. And we got on the Trenton and went to Elizabeth City. That's the first time I'd ever been to Elizabeth City. You know, I was about 14 years old. Well, that must have been uh, quite an adventure with uh, stores, with dresses and stuff, with your mama making everything for the kids and all, and then to be able to see that kind of stuff in there. I guess you thought, thought you were in New York City. <laughs> Probably. But we had a store at Rodanthe at that time that sold more than any store around here now sells anything. She used to sell everything. She used to have dry goods, and even had uh, soap and foam drinks, and ice cream, and all kind of canned goods. And I remember she had cookies about so big for a dollar a piece. I mean, a penny a piece, not a dollar a penny. <laughs> and she had everything you wanted right there in the store. Wow. Uh, it was brought down by the Julie Bell one he was talking about from Avon. Mm -hmm. That's the way it's brought down. Yep. There were two Julia Bells. Uh, Manson, do you remember? Uh, let's see. Uh, w w was it any of your kin that uh, ran the Julia Bells? There was two of them. One, one back bef during, uh, before the turn of the century, and then one later on. was. Well, the one I remember uh, I was operated by Mr. Walker Scarborough Davon, running Elizabeth City. Mm -hmm. I was another one of the boats that would run Elizabeth City and carry freight and so forth. I was the only one I remember of Judy Bell. <coughs> the other <coughs> the other boat was the Missouri and and uh, the Duncan and <coughs> my wife <coughs> my wife's <coughs> grandfather had a two master small schooner that he, they uh, they used for uh, the oyster trade, they would leave in the fall of the year, go across the sound, go around, <coughs> swung quarter angle hard, or, or uh, where the oysters were, and they would catch oysters and take them into Elizabeth City and sell them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was another one named the Hattie Creek. Yeah, I remember the Hattie Creek, yes. Yeah. <coughs> well, the Hattie Creek, that must have been an operation for a long time. That was supposedly the boat that brought the Wright brothers to uh, Kitty Hawk. And uh, this was even in my lifetime, the uh, Hattie Creef sat up there in Salvo, it was a drive-in there for a while, and then I think Hurricane Gloria got it. Uh, but uh, it's my understanding that the bow section of the Hattie Creef is still up there in Salvo. It's a wonder that, uh, you know, that'd make a nice piece to put in a museum somewhere or just, uh, you know, that's the only artifact we probably got left from, from, from the Wright brothers. <coughs> Well, Manson, uh, well, look. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, uh, <coughs> I know you were talking to me earlier about uh, left Meekins here. I'm, I'm going to get yeah. you to just kind of show this here. Uh, well, this is a, this is a sketch I made uh, a couple years ago. Uh, you heard me uh, <coughs> mention Mr. Left Meekins fishing on the beach. Well, he had nets over in the sound also. He had a long, what they call a hole net. The difference between a hole net and the break of seine net, the hole net you put it out and pull the ends together and swipe up the fish. This is what he had, a hole net. <laughs> he said, Manson, would you go help me this summer with my hole net? I said, yeah, I'll go. So he had this uh, rig. Uh, <coughs> He kept up on the north end of Avon over on the sound side. And I'd meet him every morning about daylight and we would take off. I remember going there just about daylight and he and his wife would be sitting there eating breakfast. <laughs> and they would be having a cup of coffee and some cold collard greens for breakfast. And I, 
I really couldn't go that stuff. You know, they, but anyway, we would, we would, when he was ready, would move on up to shore where he kept his boat, and uh, we would pull the net aboard and put it on the stern. That was a long haul net. We get the sail, get the thing ready, and sail out on the reef. Uh, this is I, I made this sketch some time ago, so if you get a chance to look at it, this was what we sailed in. And he he knew certain areas out on the reef where the fish most likely to be found. So he'd put me out on the shallow spot of the reef and he would take the boat with a net in it and push the net on around, come on around and keep a hole and come back up on the reef and then we'd start pulling it together and swipe up the fish. This is the rig we had there and the, uh, it's quite interesting, the, uh, the sail was held up for the wind could catch any what we call a spreet, S-P-R-A-T. Was a, was a long piece of wood that was hooked into the end of the sail and push it up so the wind could catch on it. And the front little sail was called a jib. And there's a boat, we'd have the uh, net back there and we'd take our fish and put it a little farther up forward. And uh, the anchor and stuff up in front. And uh, those skiffs, a sail skiff has a what we call a centerboard in it. Uh, motor boats like you see these days, there's no problem on going sideways, but a sail skiff with a wind blowing in it would slip sideways. So they have a centerboard run down on the bottom of the boat into the water would keep the sailboat from going sideways. And this was a centerboard. It's sticking up here in this picture, but when you're underway you stick it down under the boat and it would keep the boat going straight. That's called centerboard. And uh, I, I, I uh, I, I fished with Mr. Lepp all that uh, all that summer, and we fished all along the reef off at Avon. We'd come down off the uh, reef off uh, Buxton, catching croakers and spot and all kind of fish. It was quite an experience for me. But uh, I thought about it quite often. Then the other day, some time ago, a couple years, I sat down and I sketched the. Uh, uh, the the uh, rig. That's Mr. Left. He he was he was on the rudder and I was sitting there waiting to go across on the reef. And uh, uh, <clears throat> speaking about fish, uh, this is a little hilarity, something to laugh about. I I laugh quite often about it. <laughs> There's an old gentleman, Avon, who he was very active with horses. Always had horses and carts, and the kids loved him. So he said to me one time, he says, Manson, he says, let's go up to Little Kenny Keat tomorrow morning and, and see if we can catch a drum. A drum is a big channel bass, you know, very good eating. So I said, fine. So that morning about daylight, he came by at my house and I got in a card with him. We, we didn't have fishing rods in those days. We had small lines. We'd take the lines and uh, coil it on your hand, you'd coil it on your hand, a big coil, and on the end, you'd have a weight. We'd make ourselves out of lead and tie a hook to it. It was a hand line rig. Didn't have, we didn't have uh, beautiful rods <laughs> like you have today. So uh, anyway, Ernie's came along. We had some uh, mullet for bait, I remember. We went all the way to Little Kenny Keat. That's where we found our first slough, and a slough that I was telling you is where these fish congregate. So we went up there, it was about four miles up the beach from Avon in a horse and cart. So we went up there and started fishing. So uh, it wasn't long before I had a good bite on that line, and I pulled it up, I had a nice channel bass drum. And Ernest <coughs> came over, his name was Ernest, he came over and said, boy, you had good luck, didn't you? I said, yeah, I had a nice drum here. The drum was kicking on the beach. He said, boy, I hope I get one next. <laughs> so we fished for quite a while, and pretty soon I had another one on. Ernest was fishing right alongside of me. He didn't catch a drum. And we pulled that, pulled that uh, drum up on the beach, and, uh, and uh, the horse and cart was down by the water. And I was doing something to the, to the drum. <laughs> I looked going down the beach as Ernest and had a horse and cart. He left me. 
he left me, he went on down to Avon and left me up there all by myself. He got so disgusted. <laughs> so uh, the, the lifeboat station then over at uh, Little Kinnikeet was there with the crew in it. And my father was probably there. So I drugged the two drum over there to the station. It was quite a, quite a, quite a drag across that beach, about 30, 40 about drum. And uh, someone at the station gave me a lift back to Avon. <laughs> Well, that was very hilarious, I thought. So poor <laughs> Ernest, he, he never, he never uh, thought much of himself after that. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. But those, those channel bass like we get today, they're very restricted. You can't catch a channel bass now as a, a over, you can't keep one over 27 inches now. And uh, if you catch one, you have to turn him loose before he dies. And we, but in those days, it was a very delicious source of a good, good meal. Oh yeah. They would uh, the first meal we'd have would be uh, <laughs> they call it head and bone. You take the head and and uh, clean it out and just leave the chunks in the head and you take the backbone and some of the other part. We the natives would stew that. That was the first good meal. And then they would uh, they corn the drum and. Uh, that is, put it in salt for a couple of days and then soak it and, and cut it up in sections and then they would uh, they'd boil it, boil it and they'd fry out salt pork with it, delicious. <laughs> Do people know what salt pork is, fried crisp? Okay, they, uh, so uh, we, would, we would have that. And if there's any left over, we'd call it finger fish. You take that boiled drum and separate it and make a pile of it and put onions and tomatoes in it, and uh, onions and potatoes, and cook it. That was the next meal, delicious. A drum would last a few days, you know. Oh, boy. boy. Well, Manson, I know that uh, it's been a couple of years ago, but uh, I, I just marvel at the fact that you and, and our friend Tillman Gray, uh, y'all went up to the Arctic Circle uh, duck hunting. Yeah. Tillman, that's, that's interesting. Uh, after I... I enlisted on the Coast Guard to come back home on leave in the wintertime. I would go hunting on the reef all the time. And Tillman and a boy named Kevin Scarborough, they'd always wait for me to come home because I'd take them hunting with me. And that's the one thing that uh, kids miss these days, people, older people taking them out hunting. But uh, even today, that was many years ago, even today they talk about it and both of them are upright citizens of the community. They did good by finding something to do as youngsters. Today, uh, there's not too much to do. There's too much entertainment ashore, television and dope and so forth. But if kids could find a way to be taken fishing and so forth, they much have help. But Tillman, he always grew up, after he grew up, he always liked hunting. So in recent years, he bought a place up in Manitoba. And uh, during this time, Manson's getting a little older. <laughs> so he said, he said, Manson, why don't you come up and go to Manitoba with me this year, dug, uh, goose hunting? I said, well, I don't want to make it or not. He said, come on, I'll help you. <laughs> so uh, he and a boy down here, Anthony Fletcher, you probably know him, was on the Board of Education. He went with us. And we went up, went up into Manitoba. We flew into Chicago, took a plane in the, Man in the, in the Manitoba era. And he has a place up in Canada. We went up there, and uh, the fir first morning we was there, it was the temperature was 23 degrees. It was snowing, and uh, they helped me. They they carried my helped me carry my bags on the uh, on the plane, and they were they were real nice people, and uh, I enjoyed it. We went out that first day in Manitoba. We actually went across the line over in Saskatchewan, and. Uh, the way they make their blinds up there, they take uh, Tillman had a, uh, a like a high piece of wire fence. They would put vegetation in it, take it out there, roll it out, and uh, make a blind. Put the decoys out, and that's where you hunt, hunt geese. But the important uh, the, in, the thing I learned about that uh, goose hunting up in Manitoba is quite interesting. Those geese are migrating from from Alaska and the North Slope and everything coming down this way for where they spend the winter. So they come down in big flocks. 
and they'll gather around a lake somewhere and uh, and people in the area had uh, harvested their grain. They grow, they grow a lot of canola and, and oats and other things and and that's where the geese feed on their way down here. So, uh, But you go out in the evening and the geese come out of the lakes by the hundreds and uh, fly in a certain area where there's green and that's where they'll feed before dark. They'll leave there and go back in the lake. So you find out where they were that evening and you go there that morning before daylight and set up your hunting rig and those geese will come back in there. And it was, uh, I hunted a couple days with them. It was very, uh, very enjoyable and uh, it was a very pleasant uh, uh, trip and, and uh, Tillman paid me back for all the years. So he was a youngster with me dragging him on the reef out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know it, was, it had to be uncomfortable being out on the reef sometimes and blowing. Yeah. I think a lot of people figure we're out here in the south, and but uh, cold and wet in those boxes and the wind blowing, you had yeah. to be pretty hardy to take that. Yeah, you have to dress good. And once in a while, where the water, the combing of your box is only that high of above the sea, you have a sea breaker, but the water slashes in on you quite often. You have, to, you have to be sort of rugged. Right. Well, Zenova, we're about out of time. I'm going to let you get the last word in. Uh, you know, I could spend hours just talking with the two of you, but, you know, you told me that you remembered very well when uh, electricity came to uh, came came up in your neighborhood. That was back in the 40s. Mm -hmm. We got well, electric before we had a highway. Well, I get now, uh, you know, you were able, I guess your mother could, uh, you know, she could sew. She had an electric sewing machine after that, I guess. No, I don't think Mom ever had an electric sewing machine. She did everything. She had the a pedal machine. machine. Mm -hmm. I don't think she ever had an electric, because she was getting kind of old back then. I had one, a, a singer, but I don't think Mama did. But I learned to sew. I had to uh, make quilts, and I used to sew by kerosene lamps. I don't know how I ever did it. Wow. I made the girls' dresses. I had two girls, and I used to make their dresses. I used to do a lot of sewing. I still sew. Now I mostly sew on my fingers. We, you've got, you've <laughs> got, uh, you've got grandchildren. You've got great grandchildren. Do you have great great grandchildren? I have four. Four great great grandchildren. That's just. And nine, grand, nine great grandchildren, mm -hmm. and four, seven grandchildren. They're all living up in uh, up near you, most of them. Most of them, I have some living out in. Uh, one lives in New York, one lives in Raleigh, <coughs> one lives in Asheville or near Asheville. They're all around, but a lot of them are right here, which is good. Well, guys, we got to wrap things up. Does anybody have any questions uh, for him? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yes, uh, sir. During, during the uh, wartime, you said you weren't allowed on the beach? No. So you didn't fish at that time at yeah, all? Yeah, you weren't allowed on the beach. So for five years, uh, for the time of the Second World War, you, you didn't, didn't go out of the beach? There's no commercial fishing, fishing out here or nothing? Co commercial fishermen have always been on the beach. Even and then during the, the, and they, during the war years, of course, they were not allowed to have lights along the beaches, and oh, they, okay. they still were able to get on the beach to fish. Oh, during the daytime? Yeah. Yeah, but night-night. Yeah. Mr. Megan, do you have a particularly exciting uh, memory from the Coast Guard? What do you say? Do you have a particularly exciting memory from the Coast Guard? Uh, The, uh, my first experience in the Coast Guard was life-saving. Most of these lifeboat stations around the inlets particularly have, are exposed to people getting uh, drowned during the summertime, boats turning over, you know. And I think the most uh, uh, impressive time was, uh, I was stationed uh, at that time at a place called Ocean City, New Jersey, Great Egg Inlet. And uh, the lookout reported that there was a, uh, a man thrown from a boat coming across the bar of the inlet. We went out there, 
<clears throat> and our uh, surf boat. Surf boat had an engine motor in it and also pulling. And we, uh, just before we got there, the seas were breaking heavy on the bar. And we got fairly close to the man, and uh, he disappeared under the surface. And that was my uh, first exposure to death on the water. And uh, another time in that first station, there was four fellows in a, young, in a small canoe with a sail on it out in the ocean. Somebody called the station and said, there's people in trouble off there. <laughs> We went over there and pulled those guys ashore. They, I don't know how long they've been drifting out there. And uh, pulled them aboard. And the uh, thing that impressed me, <laughs> I had my hands on the fellow's legs. I was trying to stimulate some circulation there. He said, God Almighty, man, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> said, you're hurting my leg. You know, you know. <laughs> so impressions, you know, as you get. Having to do with life saving. Questions? But getting back to what you mentioned before by Mr. Green, he was a school teacher, Dave, on us, as you know, and he taught in the old school, as I mentioned, beside my family's home. My first couple of years, I think I was in the ninth grade, the year that the schoolhouse was, was destroyed. And Mr. Green from there went over to the uh, other school that was built recently. As for Vera, my wife, went to school, and I went to uh, uh, down at Beaufort that year, uh -huh. and Mr. 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 Green was a very effective teacher, very conscientious person, and we thought a lot of him. He tried to he tried to instill in our minds the necessity, the reason for going to school. I appreciate it. He wrote he wrote a real nice book called the Kinnikeeter, I believe the name I was. Kinnikeeter Adventure. Kinnikeeter. Mm -hmm. And another gentleman who was uh, friendly toward me, Mr. Ben Dixon McNeil, mm -hmm. you know him. Oh, he yeah. wrote a book, The Hatchersman. And uh, he and my father were very close friends. My father at that time was in the lightboat station there at uh, Cape Hatters. That's that building the Park Service occupies now, going down towards the point. And Mr. Ben Dixon McNeil lived up a hill in some houses at the uh, the Park Service probably had put there, and my father every Sunday would have him over for dinner. And one time I come home on leave, I don't know what else they had for dinner or, or what my father and he did when they were over visiting. But I came down and my father said, we'll go over and visit Mr. McNeil in the evening. <laughs> and he says, my father, I never saw him take a drink, and he never saw me drink. <laughs> Mr. McNeil says, well, George, it's about time for a cricket. <laughs> My father said, no, sir, <laughs> but I don't drink. <laughs> but anyway, that was Mr. McNeil. He, was, he, was, he wrote a nice book. Yes, he did. That was a, some, some great stories in there, yeah. and it was people like your father. Thank goodness he had the foresight, Ben Dixon McNeil, to record yeah. some of that stuff. He got the tail end of a lot of stuff that yeah. we'll never have any real yeah. knowledge of. One of the photographs I brought was a photograph of my father at the station where they buried the seamen at the, over close to where the Coast Guard station was. From San Delfino? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll have to take a look at that. Yeah. Yeah, that's an amazing picture. Buried those men and it uh, was blowing hard out of the Northeast. And you're sitting there, uh, your father and, and uh, uh, <coughs> C.C. Christopher Columbus Miller and uh, Leonard Rawlinson, and you can see where their hair is just all blown and standing out there, full reverence. The preacher's preaching, and uh, it had to be blowing 25, 30 knots. Ma'am, did you have a question? Uh, yes, there, I've read some information about the German boats off the coast and U-boats and um, some of the noise that came with it and, and whatnot. Do you have recollections well, of that? I have a slight recollection. <clears throat> when I was on the way from uh, Florida to the Officers Kennedy School at the Academy, we stopped in Avon, my wife was with me. And right by that same building on the way down at the uh, uh, point, that white building on your right going down, 
there was a tall lookout tower, several sections up, and my father was there. And I walked, I, I went up to the top and talked to the man in charge. Now this is hard to believe, and, and I often wonder if my figures may be wrong. But I took the binoculars, looking out that lookout tower window, and scanned all the way down the south of the point down towards Hatteras. And I counted, I believe it was 11 or 13 ships. One would see a mast sticking up, another with a stern sticking up, the bow sticking up, or some other indication that a ship had been torpedoed there. And one time I remember you hear, everything was quiet and you hear a whoop, and the windows would shake. And, and someone would say, there goes another ship down. Yeah, that was amazing. Uh, I was watching TV uh, a couple of nights ago, and they were talking about the Exxon Valdez and up in the Prince William Sound in Alaska and all that oil that it dumped on, uh, on the Prince William Sound. And you know, folks, uh, first six months of World War II, that happened here almost every day. And, uh, you know, I'm sure Vera, uh, Manson's wife, and everybody, my mom used to keep a, uh, uh, a little uh, milk jug full of kerosene. And uh, we had, we'd gotten carpet in our house. And uh, she said, you don't, you're not coming in your house, in this house barefooted until you get that tar off your feet. So we'd have to take kerosene and get the tar. But what it was, it wasn't tar, it was globulated oil. This was in the 60s, left over from the early, left over from the early 40s. Huge, huge amount of uh, loss of uh, life and uh, oil here. It, it was uh, it was a mess. And Carol Dillon talks about that. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yep. Uh, just want to put a plug. Carol, Carol Dillon couldn't be with us tonight, uh, unfortunately, but she is going to be speaking uh, on a regular program this summer. Y'all will have to come up to uh, uh, keep tabs with uh, James and Linda at uh, Chickamacomico Life Saving Station Historic Site. She talks a lot about her experiences as a child. Uh, of course, the book Taffy of Torpedo Junction, one of the best, uh, recognized one of the best children's books uh, published in the United States. And uh, she'll be giving a lot of talks through the summer. And if you want to ask James about it, James or Linda, uh, but I I've heard her speak before, and she does a fantastic job. Well, everybody, I appreciate you coming out. An uh, hour and a half went by very quick. Uh, thanks for coming out. We had a good turnout tonight. Tell Manson and Miss Zenova that you appreciate him being out here.